I am a very good liar. My lies are convincing and they're very believable. And there's one person in particular who I'm extra good at lying to. And that person is myself. Because I realized for 10 years, I was pretending to be one thing when underneath, I was actually something else. It wasn't that long ago, I was standing at the fall 2012 Alexander Wang Fashion Show. I was in the top tier of stadium style seating in a warehouse that held 2,000 people waiting for the show to begin. I could see directly in front of me Anna Wintour in her pitch black sunglasses and fur shawl sitting next to Dakota Fanning, who was next to Rhiannon, all swarmed by paparazzi. And I was standing there because at that time, I was the director of marketing for Alexander Wang. And I was with my colleagues and my peers at the company waiting for the show to start. And right before the show begins, the lights in the house cut and it goes pitch black. And you hear this music. When that music starts, it is heart throbbing, pumping, pulsating music that you can actually feel the vibration through the soles of your feet. There is a moment of power that happens right there. It is so amazing to be part of something that epic in the fashion industry. That power is a high, and it's actually quite intoxicating. And for one second, every single fashion show I was at, I was able to forget for just a brief moment how miserable I was at my job. Because that's what I was. I was miserable at my job. I felt that I was in this relationship with my career of 10 years up to my neck in something that looked so good on paper but was completely empty underneath. I didn't really enjoy the work that I was doing. I didn't get a lot of satisfaction out of it. And that's what made me so miserable. So to just take a quick step backward and look at this word, I'm saying miserable. It's a really strong word. I totally understand that. And I'm not speaking of grave worldly problems right now. This is not epic disasters. It's a successful career in the fashion industry. I'm not winning any sympathy awards, I don't think, with that. But I think that was actually part of my problem at the time. I felt like I had no right to complain. I felt like I had things so good, I had so much to be grateful for, I should be happy with this job. It was a job a million girls would kill for, as they say. The perks were endless, and I had so many things that were going well, but they didn't really mean anything underneath. Year in and year out, I kept working. And I think I didn't actually realize how unhappy I was, because I just kept going and going, until something else came along that I actually fell in love with. And I think life is really funny like that. Sometimes you don't know what you're looking for until it comes and finds you. And what I fell in love with was yoga. It's not just any yoga. Jiva Mukti Yoga in Union Square. Oh, some, some recognition. Jiva Mukti Yoga in Union Square. And I'll tell you though, this was not love at first sight. In fact, it was the exact opposite. The first class I ever took there, I thought it was so weird, I actually almost walked out. You go in, it's a large, beautiful rectangular room. The first thing you see is an altar at the front, a religious shrine, candles, incense, a little bit of flowers, and then statues, Hindu gods, the Virgin Mary, and someone who looked like Buddha, but I wasn't exactly sure if that was really Buddha or not. It seemed really bizarre to be mixing all of those things. But quickly, my attention got taken from the altar to the people that were quickly filling up that room. These were hardcore yogis, the real kind. The girl I put my mat down next to, sleeve of tattoos all the way up one arm and up the other one too. The guy next to her was warming up before class in handstand, up and down, up and down, full handstand like it's no big deal. And then next to him, there was another guy sitting in a very perfectly posed meditative cross-legged seat wearing a t-shirt that read, veganism will save the world. What does that even mean, veganism will save the world? I didn't understand it at the time, and I thought it was all pretty strange. Little did I know the best surprise was still coming because once class started and it was a completely full room, mat to mat. There was a bit of a silence, and then the chanting began. Full on chanting, the real kind, to Hare Krishna, 78 people swaying back and forth with their eyes closed, some clapping their hands to Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And I knew this was happening because my eyes 
were wide open in total shock and disbelief of what I was sitting in the middle of. I only had one thought. I've got to get out of here. I'm here. The door's all the way over there. There's a million people between me and the door, and I can't move. I'm actually trapped. I think this is a cult, and I'm in Union Square. What is going on? But I found the longer that I sat there, because I had no choice and I couldn't move, the more I eased into what was going on around me. I relaxed into the situation, and I felt a shift happen inside. And that shift didn't happen all in one class. It actually happened in many classes because something kept pulling me back to that studio. What I learned there over a long time is that yoga is so much more than what happens on your mat. Yoga is a life philosophy, and I found that fascinating. I started reading books like the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and the Bhagavad Gita, light reading. I started going to workshops and lectures at night and on the weekends about Eastern philosophy and understanding what the connection is between all of this. The deeper I got and the more I learned, the hungrier I became to learn even more. And after many years of going to these classes and keep showing up and studying and learning, I actually came to a point where I wanted a career change. And I thought, I want my work that I do every day to be in this field, in the yoga community, in the yoga world, not in the fashion industry. And I did not understand how that was going to be possible. To make that kind of transition, completely opposite ends of the spectrum, actually seemed totally impossible for a long time. And I spent another year or two trapped in this place of fear and confusion. And there were many things that I was fearful of and confused by, some being the very basic that any person would be with a major career change. How do you make money and a decent salary in a brand new industry that you have no professional experience in? Didn't have a quick answer to that one. I also was confused because I still saw myself as a business person. That still felt good. I enjoyed being a business person. I didn't see myself so much as a yoga teacher, so I didn't know how I was going to bridge that gap. And then finally, I realized that I was most afraid of losing my identity because I didn't realize that I had become so comfortable and felt so safe standing behind the names of the big companies that I worked for and I was so uncomfortable standing behind my own name because I didn't know what I stood for. And at some point, a few years into this, I heard a voice, I can remember it distinctly in my head, say, it's time to stop lying to yourself. It's time to stop pretending you're going to be okay doing work that does not excite you when you've actually found something that does excite you. That voice said, you have a passion you need to do something about it. And it wasn't easy, not in the slightest bit. But I am standing here today, three years later, after leaving my job in the fashion industry, as a co-founder of a company that brings yoga and meditation into offices. And it feels so good to be much more comfortable in my own skin. And these days, I can rock my own handstands in yoga class. I dabbled with being vegan for a couple years. I'm not vegan anymore. And I actually have my first tattoo. It's my favorite Sanskrit chant. I'm officially a yogi cliche right now. <laughs> but it feels so good to be me and not be lying to myself. Thank you.